Yeah. Hi, guys. Hey, welcome, Caitlin. How are we? We're we doing great. How are you? Can you like hear us it. okay? Can you see everybody okay? Everyone looks great. How are you guys doing? You're in front of um, a class at the University of Miami Law School with about 50 students. Um, and we're all really excited and grateful that you're here. Well, I am thrilled to be here and super excited to talk to all of you guys and answer some questions and have a great conversation. Also, I wish I was still a student, so I'm a little bit jealous of everybody at this moment. Yeah, it, it's like the greatest thing. Um, let, me, <laughs> let me give a little introduction, Caitlin. So so I'm, I'm going to say, you know, um, you're one of the hardest working, best prepared and toughest questioners that we have. And we'll forgive you that you went to the University of Alabama, the second <laughs> best football program uh, in the history of college football uh, to the oh, University no. of Miami. We'll see, if, we'll see how long we can hold on to even second best. <laughs> um, now, before you worked at, at CNN, um, you worked at the Daily Caller and, and you did, um, then you moved to CNN and did the morning show there. So I got to ask you about the morning show because I cannot get up early. Um, how, how early were you getting up to do that show? Um, I also cannot get up early, which I <laughs> learned uh, upon accepting the morning show. Um, it was great. I, I I actually really enjoyed it. And I think it was a good, it's something that everyone should do at some point in their life because it makes you, I think, more grateful um, when you don't have to get up that early. But uh, I was getting up at like 3.15 in the morning, essentially, to to do a lot of stuff because so much of uh, having a show is doing prep work. I mean, so much of life is prep work. And so I always like to be ultra prepared. I probably could have slept a little later if I was being a little bit lazier, but uh, I was up at 3.30 in the morning. And um, it was so funny because I had just moved to New York for the job and I would be going into the office and people would still be like leaving bars going home. <laughs> right. And yeah. like, there's nothing more demoralizing than you're the person who went to bed at like 7.30 PM and everyone else is just now not even making it home yet. There's um, great, there's great videos of of folks like when people are driving into downtown Miami, like the, the people yeah. leaving the clubs uh, at, at that hour. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, there are a lot, I think they're pretty similar in New York and Miami in the sense of how late people stay out. Um, but the worst part was like, I'd have to make my own coffee. So I'm not kidding you, since I left the morning show, I've not made a pot of coffee at my house because I just really enjoy, it's like a small pleasure to just go across the street and buy a, a cup of coffee that I didn't have to make. I love it. I love it. And now and now with the, the great show, The Source, at night, are you up later or how, do you get to bed pretty quickly after The Source? It kind of depends because obviously I'm at work until 10 p.m. Eastern. That's when the show goes off the air. We're on from nine to 10. Um, and then, you know, sometimes I'll just go home and like get on the phone with one of my siblings. But sometimes I, I go and catch up with a friend and, and hang out with them. Um, so but I'm not up super late or anything like I'm not I can't like some people I think are so wound up that they need a few hours to decompress. I could like fall asleep by like 1030 if I really needed to. That's that's pretty good. Um, that, that's pretty good. So so what is your day like now? I mean, are you are you working most of the day or, or what's a day in the life of Caitlin Collins? It's a lot of work, I think, mainly because we're in the first year of this show. So we've been on air since June and it's been really great. But but a lot of it is, you know, it's a new show. It was finding its identity at the beginning. We had a lot of new uh, team members that we were working with. And so that was a big part of it as well. And, you you know, it's kind of like making sure like you're all kind of working all day long because, you know, in the morning we're getting a sense of what are the stories that day? What are we driving to? What's going to happen that day? Who do we want to book on this? And so it's a lot of that. Um, we get started pretty early and then I come into the office around one usually. And a lot of that, you know, that sounds like crazy prep for a one hour show to prep for that long, but it's constantly changing. We were just having a meeting five minutes before this started. And we changed the order of the show. So it's kind of news. You're like, and I really think that applies to anything. But in news, you've got to be able to adapt quickly um, because that's just how the world works now. And things things are not, you can have the best laid plans, but, you know, as something breaks at 8.55, your whole show is changing. And you just, you kind of like, it's like being prepared, but also being prepared to just accept it, that all your hard work on something else has gone out the window for that day. You know, for the guests, it used to be 
we would get driven to like a studio and then we'd get there and get all this makeup put on. I need a lot. And, and then, um, you know, two minutes before you go on, like something would happen. They say like, sorry, but now with the zoom, at least it's not the end of the world when that happens, but it was yeah. brutal when you'd have to get driven down to the studio. Yeah. Well, you know, that happens to TV reporters even because when I was covering the white house, when Donald Trump was in office, you, you know, and I was pretty new on being uh, on TV in those days, but you would be prepared and you'd go out to um to do your hit. And from the time you get from like the White House CNN booth, which is underneath the briefing room that we all see on TV, to when you get to the camera, like your whole topic has changed because Trump fired somebody or tweeted something. <laughs> right. And so like it truly is like for us even. And I think that's actually one of the best skills is that you learn how to really think on the fly being in this job because- not only are you thinking on the fly, like in a meeting, but like you're on camera, everyone's watching you think on the fly. So it's like, how do you best equip yourself to do that? So early in your career, I want to talk about that because I remember this whole controversy when, you know, you were really tough on Trump and then you got banned or, or you know, precluded from going to something later in the day. What can, can you tell us a little about what happened there? We'll get to the criminal justice stuff in a moment, but got to get into this stuff. Well, this was a crazy day at the White House and for my family, which I'll explain why in a moment. But um, it was typical, like it was every other day where there's, you know, always something happening in the Oval Office or the president is signing a bill or he's meeting with someone, a world leader. And so they have they can't bring all 100 reporters into the Oval Office. It's much smaller than you think. So they have reporters, one who represents TV, one who is represents newspapers, one who represents radio and you are the ones who go in there and it just rotates every day and so we I was the tv reporter that day so not only am I responsible for CNN I'm responsible for Fox News and MSNBC and CBS and anyway it was my day to go in and you're that's you're really the closest you ever get to the president some days and so you kind of you know you want to shout a question. you want to shout a question it's the only time to get him on the record on something and President Obama was famous for never answering questions in these sessions. But reporters still shouted out the questions because you got to try. Um, Trump obviously really enjoyed them and would often engage in them. And so I went in there that day and I asked a question about President Putin. And then I asked a question about Michael Cohen, his former attorney and fixer, who he had just recently kind of split with. And neither are like topics that he loved, which obviously we knew, but they were still the biggest stories that day. So we had to ask about him and he didn't answer, which is totally his prerogative. And then we left and I thought nothing of it. I went back to my office. I was doing my work. And then when we were called to gather for the next event, I was called up to the press office and I was told by the press secretary, who was Sarah Sanders at the time, now the governor of Arkansas, uh, that I was not allowed to go to the event. Oh, my God. And she said it was because of the questions that I had asked at, at the the event earlier that they thought they were inappropriate. And, um, you know, and I recognized in that moment that, you know, you it, that's scary because as a chilling effect and you don't want certain reporters to be hesitant to ask a question because they're worried they'll be kicked out. And there was nothing inappropriate about the question. It wasn't um, anything salacious. It was about the news. And so I told them, I said, I really, I don't think you should do this. You know, it's going to set a precedent. It's going to blow up. It's going to become a big story. But they said no, that they were sticking with their decision. And so I left and I called my bureau chief, Sam Feist, and I told him what had happened. And he understood the gravity of it just as much as I did. And they would not back off their position. And so we said, you know, we don't want to make the story about us because as reporters, it's not about us. Like right. we're there to tell the story, not to be the story. And, but we also felt like it was important to to put it out there because we wanted people to know what had happened because it was important for them to be called out on it. And, you know, we did. And to their credit, Fox News defended us, MSNBC, everyone kind of banded together because everyone understood what it meant. And um, they quickly uh, they stood by it. And then the next day they they walked it back and, and unbanned us from any other events going forward. But it's just a moment for press freedom. And those things, you know, you they may not seem like a big moment in the time. But when you look back on them, you realize that you don't ever want it to be that slippery slope. But I know that that applies with law as well. And it's just something to to always keep in your mind that you don't always recognize when you're in the big moments. Right. Necessarily when you're in them. 
And and what about with the family? Why was it a big day with the family? Oh, because my poor dad was um had taken the day off and went golfing. And when I went on TV with Wolf Blitzer and I said that I had been banned from the Rose Garden event, it blew up and became a huge story. And my dad didn't have his phone on him. And he said when he got back, he had a million texts <laughs> like, oh, my God, what happened to Caitlin? And he was all freaked out because he's like having a few beers with his friends and then called me and was like, what's going on? And I had to explain it to him. It was a whole thing. He didn't know. It was just... It was like a comical day where you see like my poor innocent dad who's just hanging out gets kind of dragged into like what's going on at the White next, House. Next time he won't leave his phone off uh, while he's golfing. I try to give him a heads up now. I'm like, hey, by the way, like, <laughs> yeah. you might hear from a few people about this. So so meantime, you you get banned, they walk it back. But then Trump has you do this town hall with him, uh, um, you know, which I, I was surprised he agreed to do this. It was a, a really... Uh, amazing moment but then he goes after you during the town hall which wasn't surprising to me at all um and i i think one thing that's always important about trump that i try to stress to people who who aren't who don't cover him close up the way that we did is the one thing that everyone in that press briefing room knew is trump may have criticized us or questioned our the way we asked our questions or even tried to embarrass you at points. Um, but he always sought validation from the people who covered right. him. I still think he does He does that now. Um, and it's not something new when he was president. If you talk to people who covered him when he was in New York, he was that way with the tabloids. And he had you know, his fake name where he'd call to the tabloids and talk about how great Trump was. It was just kind of a thing that he did. And so, you know, in that in that moment, you know, when he agreed to do the town hall, I wasn't surprised. Um, but we also understood the gravity of the moment because he hadn't really done major TV interviews since he left office. So there was a lot to ask him about. Um, but I think sometimes when he doesn't want to answer a question, especially on a sensitive topic like the the classified documents, which is what we were talking about then, I believe, um, sometimes he tries to deflect and kind of get you into a fight with him. Some people take the bait. I try very much not to take the bait because it's not about an insult to me. I don't care about that. It's I care more about getting an answer to to my question. So you just always got to stay above it. You know, that was sort of the first time, you know, a real interview I had watched with you and and someone in that long format. And I told everyone afterwards and I tell you now, you know, you should be a lawyer because your cross examination <laughs> skills are really, really good. And you know, politicians, a lot of times, Caitlin, are the toughest to cross-examine, right? Because they have their talking points. You ask question over here and they answer over here. They don't they don't answer the question. And so yeah. what I was really impressed by by that interview, but really with with all of the interviews you do is you you don't let politicians get away with that kind of stuff. You sort of try to pin them down with with answering your question or at least call them out on it, right? So so yeah. what, what criminal defense lawyers do, I'll tell you our technique, is we just keep asking the question over and over um, until we get the answer, you know, an answer to the question. I think that's a really effective technique. And I actually think there's a total cross current here and overlap here in the skill set, because I had a lawyer. I've talked to a ton of lawyers. I feel like I have an honorary one year law degree um, yes. only because I, I'm kidding, because I've not done half the reading that y'all have. But um I talk to attorneys constantly, especially in this environment right now. And one attorney one time told me um, a great tactic that I don't know if I could use it because it feels really hostile. And I try not to be um, I try to be politely persistent in my interviews. But he told me um, something I should use is I know that you're answering the question you wanted me to ask you, but that's not the question I actually asked you. So right. I'm trying to think in my head of how to fold that in into an interview um, sometime. But uh, but yeah, I think it it is it's it's listening, and I think that's a skill that obviously y'all are going to to be utilizing. But I think it's it's making sure you're listening, because some people they're so thinking so worried thinking about their next question that you're not like, well, hey, I didn't really get an answer to that question, and I asked it first, so let me just follow up on it. I think that I think the best answers always come in a follow up question. So, Caitlin, what you just described is what I would say ninety nine percent of lawyers don't do in the courtroom, which is listen and follow up. And and so so many times they have their script 
and they want to get to the next question on their script without hearing the gold that the witness just told them on the stand or the non-answer the witness said. Um, uh, you know, another technique that I've, I, I like to use is when a witness is just rambling or not answering, I'll step away from the podium and just go sit in my chair and start looking at my notes. And then when he finishes, I'll get back up and say, okay, you ready to answer my question now? And, and um, you know, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's a good one. So, so the jurors like perk up with that stuff. And when they see me go back to the table and look at my notes, they're, they're like watching me instead of listening to the, to the rambling. So, I think your facial expressions can be a really big tool in that situation. You, you know, it's funny you say that because when I, when I first did an interview with you in Miami, um, right after I had turned Trump down as a client, you asked me, you know, would I speak about that? And I gave a non-answer and your face, it, I felt like you wanted to kill me when I said it. Uh, and I felt really bad actually not answering a question. I had to like recover because uh, we had not met before. Um, but I, I'll never forget that facial expression you gave me when I when I was like, I'm not answering that question about why I didn't take the case. Um, but you you kept on me. So so by the way, you covered that case, uh, uh, you know, in Miami, and I, I had to laugh because there were all these reporters staked out, you know, when Trump was making his initial appearance in August or whenever it was in the middle of summer in Miami. Poor you guys. You guys were like drenched in sweat. Uh, sitting outside of that courthouse with roosters running around. Um, <laughs> what, what What's the toughest place to to cover a case? Is it, it, That had to have been a really bad one. No, but, you know, it's being a reporter as a TV reporter seems glamorous. I think some people believe it is not, let me tell you, because it's either one extreme or the other, it seems, which was that situation where we're in Miami and we're all physically dying and, you know, there's nowhere to go in between. Like, you're just sitting outside. You just have to embrace it. And, you know, it's hard to think when it's so hot, but you're thinking about really critical things and you're you're doing it really quickly as processing what happened in the courtroom. And, but, you know, last week when Trump was here in New York and we were getting, and he was, you know, trying to get his his case with with the Manhattan district attorney thrown out it was 25 degrees and we were sitting <laughs> I freezing and we were putting like hand warmers inside our turtleneck so like it's always one extreme or the other and um I don't it's just another essence of like being prepared and making sure that that you're ready for whatever that's going to look like because you don't want to be worried about any of those external factors um, I mean, this even comes down to like how I dress. Like I always wear turtlenecks at the White House, which like became a thing. There's like a, an entire Twitter dedicated to my turtlenecks. <laughs> Caitlin um, Collins uh, turtlenecks. I got to look that I up. I don't know if I'm impressed or creeped out by it, but <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe a little of both. But it was not really a thing of like a fashion statement. It was I knew I was be, would be standing outside for hours on end and it was I needed to stay warm. So it's also things like that because I just don't want to have to worry about that kind of stuff. I want to be able to just focus on what I'm saying, what I'm asking and what I'm thinking about. I, I like the sneakers when I saw you in Miami. So I yes, I'm always in cool. sneakers. Heels, I'm like, I only wear those when I'm inside. Like I would not wear <laughs> heels outside if someone uh, paid me. The sneak, the sneakers were cool. Um, so, so tell us, we're we're gonna get into law stuff now, but can you just give, you know, I I want the students to know a little about you, like how you got your start in this crazy business that you're in. So I graduated college in 2014. I had an internship in Washington, didn't really know where it was. It paid, I think, $800 a month, which if you've ever lived in Washington, know that that's like not anything compared to like what your rent is. And, but I just took it because I was like, I want to move. I want to do something interesting. I lived in Alabama my whole life and I love Alabama, but I wanted to get out. And I got into this environment of conservative media, which was actually really fascinating to work in to watch Trump's rise as it was chronicled in the primary, because initially you know, you don't really hear this now, but but even conservatives then laughed him off and thought he was ridiculous and thought he'd only be in it for a little bit. And then you saw them embrace him as he became the nominee. And um, so I just kind of had that background. And then Trump, of course, becomes president, wins the election. I start covering the White House for, for the Daily Caller for that outlet. And then, you know, we were in those briefings every single day, which were must-see TV because of Sean Spicer. Right. And, you know, we would, I think he would call on me thinking I would ask easy questions because of where I worked. And then when he realized that wasn't the case, I think it earned me respect in the briefing room. And through that, I met uh, my bosses now at CNN and 
I had never really thought that I would be in broadcast and I never took classes on it in school. But CNN didn't really care about being this perfect presenter. They cared about having good reporters who could be on TV and tell people what was going on, because that's really, you know, people I don't think need a perfect presentation. They want someone who's just, you know, able to concisely tell them what's going on, what they need to know when they're watching the news, and then they can go on with their lives. Right. And so it was a great opportunity and it afforded me a lot of resources. And I've been at Senate, been at CNN ever since and moved to New York about a year and a half ago to anchor a show, which is also, you know, its own set of skills and challenges and one-on-one interviews, which I never had really been focused on before. Um, so it's been great. And every day I'm surprised by the news cycle still, just like everybody else, because it always gets crazier. So, so Caitlin, you cover a lot of, of both criminal and civil, you know, justice system stuff. And, and I was talking to Roy Black today, one of the great criminal defense lawyers down here in Miami. He's, he's been involved in tons of white collar and other uh, huge cases. And, and in talking to him, I was, I was asking, you know, do you think the media affects these high profile cases? Do they have an, you know, do they affect the outcome? And his position was like, in other countries, the media isn't really allowed to cover trials uh, up until the point of of verdicts like they don't it's not focused not maybe allowed but it's not a it's not a focus of the media and he believes yeah. defendants there get a, a fair shake um than here because the media is so on top of um cases and he he thought you know it affects um public perception and and those kinds of things so i was wondering what your position was on that does you know is the media affecting our our system is it is it having an effect that's an interesting um take and i don't want to discount his view because i mean clearly he's formed that opinion based on what he's witnessed and seen i i would disagree because i think you know what we're doing is really just covering it in the sense of this is how it's proceeding and you know one of the most frustrating things about when these federal trials happen with Trump, whenever they do happen, is that they won't be on camera. So it's relying a lot of it in different ways than what we've done previously. And like logistically, the way CNN covers something that's in, you know, a a courthouse in Miami, where we have one reporter in the actual room where Trump goes in, and I'm using him because obviously he's the one that we've covered the most in this sense, or for myself. And then we've got another person in the overflow room. And then we've got someone waiting right outside. And then we've got all of us at the camera. It's like a multi-person effort to not only get the information and to see and witness what's happening in the room, but also to convey it to us in real time so we can talk about it and not just wait till it's over and then be able to convey it. Because it's really fascinating things from the arguments his attorney is making, the body language of the prosecutors and the defendants. Those are things that I think are super interesting. And my whole thing is always more transparency is better. I don't I think it would be so odd to keep things from the public, especially in major trials and how they're shaping up before until they're actually being decided. So you don't and think I, we should have uh, Palmetto High School students having to run out and tell you what happened in the courtroom, like uh, like what happened in Miami? Right. Because also those students were amazing and I was obsessed with them and the fact that they were able to do that. But, you know, there's a lot of risk in the game of telephone there. One person is passing on something to something else. It's always better when you watch something, you witness it, and you come out and you talk about it. And so I I think transparency is better. And I think the American people are smart enough to be able to watch a legal proceeding play out in real time, form a, a nuanced opinion on it, and then make a decision once, you know, the jury has decided. It is interesting, though, right? Because... You know, you can't obviously show all of the court proceedings. And, you know, we used to have court TV, which showed like, I guess we still do have court TV, but showed like, you know, uh, gavel to gavel coverage. But people aren't watching that. They're watching the snippets on on social media or on your mm-hmm. show. And so are they is the public getting sort of a weird perception of what's going on? I mean, I I was in law school during the OJ days. I mean, unless you watched the trial, the news reports every day was OJ's guilty. He's going to be found guilty. This is a slam dunk case. And then, you know, was the shock of the verdict. 
I think in part because the media covered it as such a slam dunk that was going to happen. Well, that's a good point because the everyone in the media, obviously, they're not attorneys. And I think, you know, you don't always know what's going to happen. And you never know what's going to happen. I, I always say you should never predict because we do this with political cycles sometimes where we read polling every day. We develop this theory based on what the polling shows us. And then we have this expectation and sometimes we ourselves are surprised or the audience is surprised come election night when the voters say something different. Right. And so I think it's always good to have humility when you're approaching these situations and to say, we don't know how this is going to progress. We don't know that this is going to happen before the election. Here's what we know so far. And, you know, but, but you know, there are moments where in Atlanta last week, when the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, got up to testify in her defense where I think having cameras in the courtroom was actually amazing and really effective there. And to be able to watch that play out, I I thought was, you know, incredible television, but also it's great for people to be able to see her make her own argument and people to be able to hear it from her voice and her mouth than, you know, what we've been reading in court filings and whatnot. And I so- totally agree with you on 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 cameras in the courtroom. I, you know, you and I have spoken about this I've, and I've written about it. I think there yeah. should be cameras in the courtroom. But I guess the, the question is, like, Fonnie Willis is, is a good example of, of why I think, and I agree with you, like, you know, people were talking about her demeanor, the way she walked into the courtroom, the way she said, I'm tested, like, all that was, I mean, I was glued to the TV. Um, so so to me, that's really important. Um, but she, I think, complained about it. And, and her dad did as well, saying, like, it's leading to death threats against her, um, leading to um, people showing up at her house. Um, things like this. I mean, so there are, I guess, some negatives from that she's raising. Yeah. And I I think that, I mean, she's been dealing with that for months. And, you know, also it was amazing to hear from the Republican. um, I think he was the former governor. I don't remember what his position was. Um, He had been asked to come and join her team. And he said no, because he was worried about that. he, He said the rest of his life would be ruined just because by essence, you would always be a public name, you would be known, and there are insane people in this world that we've seen. But but I think that that happens all throughout our court system, even for things that aren't on camera. I mean, I think of the judge who lost her son because of someone that she had sentenced who was, who was unhappy with her sentencing. And so you just see this. And I, I just think it's a, it's a reminder to be careful and to not sensationalize things and to to explain them to people, to prepare them for all outcomes, don't lead them down a road because we don't know where it's going. And I always just think it's better to be upfront and honest with with what we're seeing uh, as reporters, what we're hearing from attorneys and what's happening inside the courtroom. So one of my pet peeves about the coverage of high profile cases is so often the guests on all of these shows are former prosecutors. Um, and so as if the former prosecutor has something more to say than like a non-former prosecutor. Um, so it, 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 that I think does affect the coverage is, you know, prosecutors see the world through a prism that they grew up in. They grew up prosecuting cases. And so I always wonder like, why don't we have more of an open debate about some of this stuff than have just former prosecutors as at, make up most of the guests on on these shows. That's a really good point because you don't want just so cuz not everyone sees the lens through the the world through the lens of a prosecutor and you know it's really informative I think to talk to someone like an Ellie Honig who is on our air all the time breaking yeah. down uh complex legal arguments or or what's happened in the court and translating it for for other people who did not go to law school and don't have degrees. Um, but that is a good point. And, you know, one thing we try to do a lot is have the attorneys themselves on who are representing, like, I I think with Colorado, we did this with the 14th amendment fight. Um, we would have the attorney who was representing Trump in that case, Scott Gessler, who was the former, um, solicitor general in Colorado and, or former secretary of state. And so he was super helpful because he knows exactly what he's arguing because he's been in that position, but now he's on the reverse side. But then we'd also have Jenna Griswold, the current secretary of state. And so people could really get a sense of both arguments, which I thought was really effective. So then when these arguments went before the Supreme Court and we got to listen to them, which was 
fascinating to hear all the voices of the justices and what they were asking. I think our audience was pretty well set up for that. And I think a lot of people have a pretty good idea of where the Supreme Court's going on that. We um, need cameras in the Supreme Court, Caitlin. We need cameras in the Supreme Court. So, so that's I feel like that's probably thing. never going to happen. <laughs> never going to happen. But you know, <laughs> you know, you do get such wonderful guests. I'll tell you another pet peeve of mine, though, about the not from your point of view, because of course you want Trump's former lawyers on there. But when Ty Cobb comes on or Parlator comes on and they badmouth their former client, it drives me bananas. I can't. why because they they have a even though he's a former client. He, you have a duty um, to your former client not to bash him and not to get up. It just, to me, it's it's a bad look. Like I have former clients, people ask me about all the time, I, you know, Glenn Maxwell, Charlie Adelson. Um, I would never say a bad word about a former client of mine. I, I just think it's so unseemly. And by the way, I, I like both of those people. So, so, so I, I, sh I should be careful, but you know, I think it's 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 just wrong for defense lawyers to get up and talk badly about their client. Well, that's interesting. And I hope you keep that view to yourself, because I'm always trying to convince <laughs> former attorneys to come on and share with us the dirt, because I especially with Trump, just as someone who's covered him, I think they know better um, what is what it's really like and what's really happening than anyone else. And that's always what I'm interested in is getting as close to the source as possible because I just think it offers a better perspective. Uh, we do have some people on, and you know, one dynamic that we're always interested in um, in Trump world is the different attorneys interacting with one another because they have very different styles. He has people that he likes to go on TV and fight for him, but that's not always the same person who translates well inside the courtroom, as, as you well know. And so that's an interesting dynamic that we've kind of gotten some of the former attorneys to talk about. But it matters because it can drive some of them from the team, as it did last summer with two of the top attorneys on the federal cases. And it, it can drive people to not accept to potentially uh, join the team. And so that's always an interesting dynamic because obviously who's representing him is incredibly significant. And and Ty Cobb, of course, couldn't help himself at the restaurant where he was overheard um, talking about the case. So, so I mean, it's not a surprise that he's uh, he's on TV, I guess. Yes. For people who aren't familiar, this is where at BLT Steak, which is a very popular Washington establishment, two of Trump's attorneys, Ty Cobb, who was inside the White House, and John Dowd, I believe, who's not inside the White House, were outside on the patio just talking at length about pretty sensitive details about a case and the new york times bureau is right next door to this very popular restaurant so a lot of reporters go eat lunch at it and this one reporter happened to be there and his guest that he was sitting with he realized what was going on and he basically was ignoring who he was having lunch with and the person left and he stayed just sitting there drinking coffee hanging out writing down what they were saying and then wrote a story off of it incredible it was amazing and Incredible. really embarrassing for them. And so if you're an attorney, just don't have lunch in a public place. Yeah, I'm, I mean, although I guess you reporters love it. Um, yeah, so I love it. <laughs> we disagree. I want you to tell me what your client was like, and I want you to speak loud yeah. publicly on the phone in an airport, but you may not. <laughs> so, so Caitlin, one of the things that we were studying in in this class is a very old case, the Sam Shepard case, which which made the movie The Fugitive. And, and that case got reversed by the Supreme Court, that conviction, because there was too much coverage in the newspaper. It was trial by newspaper. And of course, now we have, you know, trial by television was the OJ case. And now, in a lot of ways, there's trial by social media. And, you know, although I don't think former lawyers should be out speaking about their client, I think there is a duty of the current lawyer to be on your show, to be on social media, to be out there defending their client, because somebody needs to be speaking out there for them. And and too often, I think we see defense lawyers afraid to engage with the media on social media, those kinds of things. Um, how important do you think it is for defense lawyers and even sometimes their clients to get up there and, and defend themselves? Publicly? Yeah, publicly. To defend themselves or their clients? Well, the defense lawyer to defend okay. their clients or even bringing a client on. I mean, I've seen that sometimes. I mean, um, you know, Greg Craig, who was the Clinton lawyer back in the day, he got charged himself and did a YouTube video 
defending himself and, and was acquitted. And I think that YouTube video really helped him to get the word out both to the media about his defenses, about who he was and so on. Well, this is kind of one argument that I've made privately to to Trump's team, which is, you know, sometimes they do send out the made for TV people, but right. but they don't often send out the people who have a really wealth of experience and are really the ones who are handling the cases and arguing them. And I think that I my argument was kind of it doesn't benefit you guys because people think the TV lawyers are your real lawyers and they're not. It's the other people, the really serious people who are the ones arguing it. And so I've always advocated to get those people on the show because I do think they can do a, a good job explaining their position, saying, you know, here's what we per are pursuing. We did this on one night when Trump was indicted um, in the classified documents case. We had a feeling it was coming because he had gotten a letter. His team had gotten a letter. But um, that night we had made an agreement with Jim Trustee, who was on his team at the time, to join us once he was indicted. And it was just really helpful because it cleared things up in the sense of he could tell us what the charges were before the indictment was unsealed. He could kind of give us his initial reaction, tell us, you know, how they plan to respond in the coming days. And I actually thought that it was really informative, even if you disagreed or if you thought his arguments were were compelling. I thought it was just informative all around to have him on saying it instead of having us reporting on what the charges great. were. This was someone who actually saw the the letter itself. And so uh, I, I totally agree. I think it's helpful. I guess if you're not careful, it could get you in hot water if you're with a inquisitive reporter. But uh, I would not say that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's funny because I think Trump got himself into trouble in the New York case because instead of having his TV, TV lawyer on TV, he had his TV lawyer in court. Yeah. And uh, that got him in a little bit of trouble. I think with the judge, he was just so frustrated with with Alina Haba in court, not it, by the way, I thought she was a very powerful speaker and, and she was making powerful arguments. She just didn't know the mechanics of, you know, how to get something into evidence and do some other things, which was just yeah. frustrating the judge. Yeah. And we saw how it worked against them in that situation. But I, we also heard the, the reverse from other people who said they thought she was, that she was effective in, in how she appealed to the jury. Um, so, yeah. All right, one more area I want to ask you about, and then I'm going to have some students come up because I know they want to ask some questions. So if you guys want, just start lining up and and I'll and I'll ask you. But one one area is that, you know, before your time, it was prosecutors never went on air. They never had press releases. Um, they never I, I know you don't like when I say press conference, but I'm not exactly sure how to phrase it when they when they come in front of the reporters and sort of explain the indictment. Yeah. Um, what do you what do you call that? Not a press conference? I only I a press statement. I don't know. I, I think yeah. press conference is you're taking questions in my OK. Opinion. So but, you know, uh, you know, the Southern District of New York is is famous for this, you know, having these press statements or whatever they are, where they have big blow ups and, and they, you know, talk through the charges. And it never used to be like that. Even even Jack Smith, by the way, had a had a you know, he came out and gave a statement with the American flag behind him. Um, should. Should prosecutors be speaking to the press? I mean, I know as a as a reporter, you're going to say yes, but is that really the job of of a prosecutor who's prosecuting a case to get up in front of the camera and start talking? I think sometimes for prosecutors, it's just as effective to not speak publicly, though. It, 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 the message kind of gets across like it, it, Jack Smith, obviously, is one of those people we've truly heard from him one time since he has been the True. special counsel. Fair, fair. And We've followed him, you know, to Subway where he gets his lunch, see it in cameras, walk in and he goes in and he gets a sandwich and he leaves and he doesn't speak. And so, you know, but it kind of he speaks through the filings. So every time we get a filing, we comb through them to see like what he says in there. I think he speaks when he comes into the hearings, the court appearances. And so I think sometimes that's just as powerful. On the reverse, you have people like the attorney general here in New York who Every day when they would go into court, um, she would come out and make a brief statement at the end, not take any questions, and then leave. I think, you know, I don't know. I, I'm definitely not someone to tell prosecutors what to do. Mm -hmm. I enjoy hearing from them because I think it, it, you know, gives us a better understanding of where they're going. 
But I think the one thing we've really learned is to to listen to what they say in court filings. And, and that's really their their statement in and of itself. And it used to be that even the court filings, like the indictments, didn't have as much um, gold. And I'll say gold because, you know, you see Senator Menendez's indictment and they put pictures of the gold. Actual in, gold. Yeah, actual I gold. Whose job, in, I wonder the guy whose job it is to take the pictures of the evidence, like, with Trump's documents, Menendez's, you know, jackets that had his monogram with the cash stuffed in the pockets, like whoever's job that is, I think is fascinating. Although Fonnie Willis just had a similar defense to to Menendez that she kept cash in the house and paid, um, you know, paid uh, with cash without any, you know, that was Men that's Menendez's defense, although it's with gold bars. And to I will say to one of my colleagues credit. He tracked down the winery in Napa that they went to, and the person who runs it did confirm she did pay in cash because they were like, no one pays in cash anymore, really. And we thought it was unusual, but we remembered it. Wow. Terrific. All right. We have a bunch of students. They're going to come up. They're going to say They're their great. name. I don't, we're not going to keep you too much longer, but I'm going to have them um, ask some questions. They'll they'll tell you their name. They're asked the question. I'm going to step aside so they can do it. Thank you, Caitlin. Lovely. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Timur. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, so one of the big things controversial right now is how John Oliver offered uh, Justice Clarence Thomas a Winnebago plus like a monthly salary out of his own pocket to like ret uh, retire from the Supreme Court. And in the uh, segment and subsequently after they emphasize like the legality of such an offer and a lot of his actions anytime like him uh, for instance uh, he does anything for his show he specifically talks about clearing it with the legal department so my question for you is to what extent are you involved with the legal department or what extent does the legal department at cnn or any other news or agencies that you're aware of like brief you about what you can and cannot ask what actions you can and cannot do uh, so like again as uh, a lawyer like um I'm just fascinated about like, is it more preemptively warning you or is it afterwards telling you you shouldn't have done that? Everyone knows the lawyer, the top lawyer at CNN, his name is David Vigilante and he's excellent. And he always will weigh in on, not always, but he will weigh in a lot on on, on conversations or editorial conversations that we have We have when we have our big 9 a.m. call um, with something to that nature. And then we have a whole team uh, called the Triad. And when you write a sensitive legally sensitive story that's you know not just chris christie dropping out of the race if it's a legal story that has you know potential ramifications it is vetted by our triad team and so they make sure that the language puts us in the best position possible to protect ourselves because people are really litigious against the press that being said you know we obviously enjoy pretty extensive first amendment privileges thankfully there is a protection no. for, the, for the free press um, but it is something that we're mindful of when we're mostly when we're publishing digital stories online about something um, sensitive. We do. We have an entire legal arm that handles that because that is definitely a concern. What do you think Clarence Thomas's number is to retire? How much? Yeah. How much do we got to pay him? Here, come on. Next. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, that one I'm going to decline to comment. <laughs> Well, my question is not as difficult, Caitlin. Um, my, <laughs> my name is uh, Ashley. Thank you so much for speaking with us. My question is really practical, actually. So as somebody who reads through filings and as someone who listens to lawyers speak all the time, I'm sure you have a really interesting like take, especially as a, obviously as a journalist, on the things that you most appreciate that lawyers do, that like things that we say or the way that we write that easily allows you to translate that to um to the people that are your audience. So do you have any tips for us as we do that? You know, better ways to write, better ways to speak that like are effective for us, obviously, but are also helping you as well. I love this question because it is like, you have to think of the people who are reading it. Like we have incredibly, we have a lot of former attorneys turned reporters and we have a lot of people, you know, who are reading through these who can translate it. But I love when I can read through it and I can look up at the TV and say, here's what they're saying in here and here's why. I think one creative thing that I've noticed, you know, from from doing this that attorneys or judges do, and Judge Engron did it last week, is to quote like a movie or a poem or like some kind of cultural reference to kind of like have an analogy to what you're arguing and what you're saying. That has always been really helpful. And I think it's also helpful for, you know, regular people to to understand when it's kind of just put in, in layman's terms in an example. And one other thing I think of is when Trump was arguing his appeals, his broad immunity claim to the appeals court in Washington, 
you know, the judge said, you know, it was all in this like term of like perimeter, outer perimeter and official duties and what's in his scope. And the judge just said, OK, so hypothetically, he could order SEAL Team 6 to kill his political opponent. Yes, it was extreme. But the way she said it, I think summed it up for any person watching. They understood what the argument was from there. Biden, Biden knows what he has to do. So, you know, there there is um, <laughs> there is this big debate amongst lawyers right now about what you just talked about, whether judges should be using pop culture analogies, those sorts of things in writing. I'm all for it. And and there's some great judges in the 11th Circuit, Robin yeah. Rosenbaum, some others who have done that. But there's a lot of backlash, surprisingly, saying, you know, that's not what an opinion should be. An opinion shouldn't be talking about some pop culture reference. It should be tight and and about the law, which I totally disagree with. Me too. And I think of that when I talk on TV. I'm like, how do I explain this to someone who doesn't pay attention to every single thing President right. Biden does or the White House or Capitol Hill? I think it's better to meet people where they are and to, to explain it to them. OK, here's the next one. Hi, Caitlin. Um, Hi. I'm Alexandria. I'm also from Alabama. So, oh my God, roll tide. Yeah. Are you War Eagle? <laughs> huh? Are you roll tide or War Eagle? Roll tide, of course. Okay, good. <laughs> I mean, there's there's no decision. I anyway, love it. <laughs> um, I agree. I think interviewing, like the interviews that you do, especially with like hostile witnesses like Donald Trump that like obviously don't want to answer the questions. How do you come up with your questions for that? Like, do you come up with your questions kind of thinking about what the answers will be? Or do you come up with the questions where you just want to ask about these topics because you need to know the answer, like, regardless of what it is? I think it's a mixture of both. And I think one of the things, it, it's a learning process. The more questions you ask, the better you get at asking them and, and writing them and formulating them. And... um. I think one is a lot of prep of everything that person has ever said. It's easier for me because everybody Great I interview team. is always on TV or like doing interviews. Um, so you so you want to know where they're going to go. Like you'll know where they'll take it and you want to find holes in those answers. That's what I always try to do, because a lot of people get away with just saying the same shit every single day. Right? Yeah. And then no one really follows up. And sometimes I'll watch interviews and I'm like, that's not true. And so I'll make a note, like, make sure you point out that that's not true because no one else has pointed it out. And so I think it's a mixture of short questions. It's a mixture of one, two punch questions where you ask one question, knowing where they're going to go and then having a sharp follow up. I think it's it's kind of like formulating those. I think it's also talking them through with someone is always really helpful to me. Um, I have a really great researcher on my team, Patrick, and so we'll kind of talk through the questions and he'll say, well, he's going to say this to that. And I'm like, OK, so what should our response be? And then we'll formulate something. And um, that's that's a really key part of it. And um, but it's also making sure you're listening because they'll make some news or they may have an unexpected answer or sometimes they'll answer your question and they won't say yes or no, but they are saying yes or no. So I'll always just respond and say, OK, so that's a yes. That's so what that's what a good cross examiner does, too. See, I'm <laughs> telling you, you should be a lawyer. We Maybe have, I will. Who knows? It's not too late. So I, I know um, I don't want to keep you too long. We have three more student questions, if that's OK. Let's do it. OK, let's do it. Hi, Caitlin. Thank you for meeting with us. Hi. Um, one thing that stuck out to me at the beginning of class was when you mentioned that you feel like the press being in trial and in the courtroom was almost just giving transparency to the American people and how you felt like if you just delivered the exact news and all of the circumstances that people could make an opinion on their own. But as a law student, all I can think about is like how the rules of evidence were basically founded on the fact that they didn't want the jury to take every ounce of information and decide on their own because people can be too emotional or they want people to move with logic. So how do you feel like that balance translates into the press coming into the courtroom? That's a really good point and, and one that I didn't think of as just a non-lawyer who's not thinking of it in the way that, that y'all are. And I think that's a really good point in the sense of it's not always the full picture or maybe it's something that's not ultimately allowed in. And, you know, how does that work in their judgment? Because, you know, sometimes the judgment will be will be different. So I, I don't know. That could actually make me rethink part of my answer. Uh, I just always think that 
transparency is best in the sense of people making their judgments off that. But I think that that raises a, a good point in the sense of it's not always clear cut. It's not always a yes or no or a black and white kind of thing. It, it sometimes is a little ambiguous in the sense of how do you afford people? And, and, you know, the people who are in there are innocent until proven guilty. And so you want to make sure that you're affording them that right that they have. Right. Um, I like to say not until proven guilty, unless proven guilty. That's what I like to say. But um, here, we'll have the next question come up. That's good. Hi, thank you for coming and speaking with us. Um, I was just curious, based on the stuff that we've been covering recently, and also just talking about how when cameras aren't allowed in the courtroom and you're kind of being fed information, has there ever been a time where you or someone, you know, at CNN or any of your other positions has made a mistake about the information they were given? How does that cleanup happen? What, like what happens in the situations where- Caitlin's never made a mistake. What are you talking about? <laughs> Perfect. So the situations are. where, you know, you thought that you had the right information, but you simply don't. It's scary because your whole life is on the line. I feel like for me personally, maybe I'm putting too much emphasis on it, but when I was reporting on the Trump White House, um, and I was actually just having this conversation yesterday. I don't know if y'all are paying attention to the informant story that that just happened where- the FBI had this informant. Turns out he was lying and making all this stuff up, but he had been an informant for like 10 years. And I was talking to our justice reporter and I said, how did they make this mistake? Like, how did the FBI not know this? And they were like, well, it's kind of like as reporters, you know, we're not always dealing with saints and angels who are like, you know, I would love to tell Caitlin this honest, completely unbiased story. You know, to every person, a story is a different perspective and it's their truth, but it may not be the truth. And so- your job as a reporter and you know is to find people you trust whose information you trust and you know it's always helpful to have a second source or another way to corroborate it or an email or a text or a voicemail because you know people's memories aren't perfect and if they tell you in a quote that someone said something it doesn't necessarily mean that they did and one thing i think i learned from being at the white house was i was always super careful and, you know, it would make me sick to my stomach sometimes when we published something, even though we knew it was right, it would still make me second guess myself because I never I never wanted to put something wrong out there. And so we'd always try to to use different parts of our team who are different, who are better sourced in other areas to try to corroborate it. And, and just if we weren't really confident in it, we just wouldn't use it because it's not worth the risk, in my view, of putting something out there that you're not 100 percent sure on because these are people's lives. We're reporting on people, you know, not just robots. And I think the second part of that for reporters, and I think this will happen, you know, in, in the courtroom, and I think people always appreciate honesty. So if we ever mess up, which we certainly have or gotten a little too far over our, our skis on something, we own up to it. And it's not fun to correct your own report or to have that, but it's important to do that because then people trust you when you do correct. It, it actually... You may think it like hurts your credibility. I think it adds to your credibility 100%. if you're willing to, to go back and correct something. You know, Caitlin, the informant story is exactly where you need some defense lawyers because we could tell you, do not trust the <laughs> informants. They always fucking lie. So, you know, the government loves to just trust them and listen to these criminals and they always get misled and and this always happens. So, so you know, um, that's what happens with informants. Last question for you. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. My Hi. name is Nancy. Um, I'm a little bit curious more about social media and how you think that impacts the fairness to defendants and criminal trials really, and how you as a reporter interact with social media? Like, how do you take that information in a way that's helpful? I know you talked about transparency some. So is there any situation where you think social media is helpful in getting a message out there? Or is it usually kind of hindering in these kind of situations? I'm really torn on social media because I think as a reporter, it's super helpful. It's a great resource. It's immediate. It's fast. It's quick. I love reading Twitter when something huge has happened, when like a brief has dropped. Because someone's going to get to a different line before you do and, and see it before I do. And I, I just, I enjoy it. And I enjoy the discourse. I think it can also obviously be super harmful and it can create a bias. And no one is out on the internet, like trying to do good or like trying to compliment someone or make their day or give them the benefit of the doubt. It's the opposite. 
and people like to have trial by Twitter all the time when we see it, you know, the, what's the old saying, which is there's always one person who is, um, the person of the day on Twitter. You never want to be that person. <laughs> it's, it's, so true. it's like whoever they're talking about, you don't want to be that person. Um, so I don't know. I, I take social media at face value and I use it when it's helpful, but I don't rely on it by any any sense of the way. But it is sometimes helpful for feedback. You know, sometimes when I do an interview and maybe I had the wrong tone or I was like, you know, it, I didn't ask a follow up the way that I should have. Sometimes people will like message me and tell me that they'll message me basically every day. Some happy thoughts, a lot of bad thoughts. But, you know, you just have to kind of take it at face value um, and use it when it's helpful. But when it's not, you know, you got to like take it as it is and not let it be too much on you. I have to say, I think one of the real great reasons for your success, and I hope you take this as a compliment, is the way you develop your sources and that you're texting with all of them all the time. I mean, I deal with tons of reporters all the time. And I have to say, you are always texting your sources and folks um and and to me that's why i love the name of your show because you are really good at at developing sources well i think that's one thing um that anyone can benefit from which is i'm always having conversations about what's going on with people uh, they're not my friends i don't necessarily agree with them but i'm always talking to them lawyers who represent trump people who work in the biden white house because when you have better perspective and you don't just live in a bubble it always will make you sharper and better. And, you know, there's one attorney who I always call when a filing comes out and we'll talk it through. And I, I ask what his thoughts are on on how he read it. And it makes my conversation, even if I don't reference it and it's off the record, it makes my conversations sharper when I'm actually on the air and it makes them better and it just dis distinguishes them. So I think having conversations constantly with your classmates, with your mentors, with your colleagues, with your peers, that is the way also to to develop yourself in that sense. You're not existing in a bubble. Have conversations. Ask questions that you think are stupid. If you don't understand it, try to figure it out because you're pretending like you know it isn't going to benefit anybody. And so I'm just always not afraid to ask the question, I think, because I'm curious and I want to know what's going on. And I don't have like pride or anything and like, you know, that I need to know everything. Like we're doing this for a reason to to find things out. So Caitlin, um, you're on, you can't see it, but you're on two huge screens in Gosh. front of all these students, really big. And and so what I'd like to do as I'm going to ask you one last question, but I'm going to run around and we're going to take a selfie with the with all the students and the screens and I'll send it to you. But I, I want to ask you one last question. Um, and I, I like to ask this question because, you know, we we know you from TV and and we know you like Alabama and that's one hobby. But I, but but what else do you do for your free time? Like, what are your hobbies other than like talking to all these lawyers all day long and, and watching Alabama football? And as you answer, I'm going to go around so you won't see me. and We're going to take a picture with you. OK, well, Alabama football is always like my given answer for this. So people think that I'm like normal and have a fun life. But um, Alabama football obviously has now become a source of strife for me since Saban retired. And um, even though he's still my background on my on my phone, um, I would say that I just I, I like to spend time with my friends who have no nothing to do with politics or anything in this world and hang out with them and, okay. you know, talk to people who have nothing to do with what with what we're doing, basically. OK, well, we'll forgive you for, for the Alabama football part of it. Um, <laughs> have you had Saban on the show yet or not yet? We haven't had him on. He won't. When he was um, the coach at Alabama, he would not do interviews because and this is the most Saban thing ever. He was worried it would affect recruiting. So he never did CNN. He never did Fox. He didn't do anything that wasn't like a broadcast because he didn't want to ever seem political uh, even though we promised to only talk football. And so we're working on on trying to get something done um, this time. But we'll see. I'll let you guys know. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much. I know how busy you are. I know um, how incredibly hard you work. And so to take an hour out to do this is really awesome, Caitlin. And and it was great, so informative, and we learned a lot. So thank you so, so much. Well, you guys had great questions and you have an amazing teacher and professor. And so you're in very good hands. And so, uh, yeah, next time I'm in Miami, everyone should come by the set. We'll potentially be there this summer, mid-June, maybe hanging out. We'll see. Another sweltering uh, time to, we got to yeah. figure out how to get the trial in February. So yeah, I know. Exactly. We'll see. Thank you, Caitlin. Anyway, thanks Thank guys. So great much. questions. Really smart group. I really appreciate you.
Thank you. We appreciate you. Bye.